Hey everyone, it's Ben from Songwriters on Process, and today I have my interview with Grammy-nominated artist Yola. Now, Yola has been nominated for two Grammys this year. I've written them down to make sure I get them right. Uh, the first is Best Americana Album, Stand For Myself, and the second is Best American Roots Song for Diamond Studded Shoes. Uh, that's two Grammy nominations this year. So this interview is audio only. As I've told you before, sometimes artists can't do video, and so we've got to make do with what we can. So this one is audio only. Um, so make sure you check it out. I was going to transcribe it, but uh, she's so enthusiastic and it's such a great conversation. So I think that would have been lost had I transcribed it. So that's why you've just got the audio. Um, the thing that struck, struck me the most about this, you know, I talked to a lot of songwriters who do these motions. They talk about grabbing songs out of the air. Um, but Yola is, has a different approach to it. She talked a lot. We talked a lot about brain science in this, believe it or not. And I don't think I've ever talked about, uh, that with songwriters, but she talks about the colliculus and the colliculi and the impact that has on her songwriting process. So I will let you check it out. Uh, it is a great interview. Um, again, audio only. Um, if you have not subscribed to the channel, please subscribe and stay tuned for interviews. So, yeah, Everyone, thanks for watching. So, um, anyway, so let's get started. So I guess the first question I always ask is, um, outside of songwriting, uh, how much writing are you doing, whether it's journaling or just kind of, you know, stuff like that? I think um, when I, uh, my entry into writing was through poetry um, and I suppose it was school. And so when I was, when I left that environment, I pretty much tunnel vision angled that towards um, songwriting. And I feel like I've stayed in that pattern that I spend so much time trying to absorb maybe more than like document. I'm, I really want everything to kind of coalesce in my calliculi <laughs> and like process and so that I find something salient and so oddly I remember I used to journal and I would find that like ideas would come out in these separate ways but sometimes I would just note things down in my notes function and they were things that were had been coalescing in my mind that weren't necessarily it wasn't a specifically journaling it wasn't specifically anything that's my form of writing over the hmm. year I'll just like something will jump into my head and it might be like a concept like that I want to like explore further it might be some lyrical ideas it might be um something that I know isn't necessarily going to sing but it's going to give birth to something that will sing um yeah like um I I am married to my, the notes function on my phone <laughs> that's how I'm writing right now right and that's how, I, I was gonna say, I that, yeah I hear that very often it's funny because you mentioned journaling so I think I can probably categorize songwriters into three categories songwriters who have never journaled and have no desire to those who do and love it and those who don't but really really wish they do um but it sounds I like i have no desire to at all yeah you have no yeah. desire to. okay um <laughs> so when it comes to absorbing i mean are, are you you know songwriters always tell me how hyper aware they are you know they talk about the antenna that they have up are you consciously looking for things or I mean, I guess you know what I'm saying, how conscious are you of your environment when it comes to looking around um, and noting those things that you hear or see, or is it more just kind of passively, passively accept them and say, oh, boy, that sounds like that might be a song idea. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And I think like, um, so I've got a little bit of an obsessive neurological approach to everything that I do. I, I don't ever really want to be muscling it with my prefrontal cortex where yeah. possible. Um, um, it's important for me to use the parts of my brain that take in all the information, that take in all of our information, you know, um, and so I've, I've, I've farmed a lot of this work out to the colliculi, the parts of your brain that are, are really taking in information from your peripheral vision. And so when you're zooming past the billboard on a, in a car, you're not consciously taking in that information via prefrontal cortex, but your colliculi are collecting it 
and putting it in the recess of your mind. And that's why people spend so much money on something you're going to drive past at 50 miles an hour. Um, because your collectively are far more adept at amassing information than your prefrontal cortex is. Your prefrontal cortex is great for analyzing that information once gathered. And so like, I really wanted to not be analytical in my process and to allow like our perceptions to bump into each other, to find something that felt salient to me. Um, and if I felt if I muscled that with my conscious mind, that I could potentially fabricate something based on whatever issues I'm dealing with at the time. Yeah. Whereas if I allow something to go in via my collectively through the unconscious part of my brain, but the extremely aware part of my brain that we've been using since birth to form our awareness of the, our environment, you know, the world that we live in. Um, that I'd get something that felt more elegant in its connection. And like, I feel like I can feel that in the lyrical content of this record in comparison to maybe the first record, which was maybe a lot more prefrontal cortex in mm. its composition lyrically. All right, now, I was, not, I was never good in the sciences. I, I know what the prefrontal cortex is, but you said collectively yes. about 10 times. I have no idea yes. what that is. So yes. you got to explain it because I'm not going to, I wouldn't even know how to spell that if I Googled it. So what, <laughs> what, what is that? So is you have like an area of your brain called the superior colliculus, but your clickly are parts of your brain that deal with, for intents and purposes, your peripheral vision and all of the things that you are not focusing on, but absorb. So you could be looking like in the mirror, but you might be aware of the television in the corner of your eye. Mm -hmm. You're not watching it, you're looking in the mirror, but you like you might be picking up some information if it's just within your peripheral vision enough for you to see a person walk like walk up or put across the screen. You'd be like, oh, that was so-and-so actor. Yeah. And you might not be focusing on that. It's a similar thing that we can use when we're being hypnotized. They'll make us focus on something like the ticking of a clock and the idea that we try and tune out what they're saying and that can jump into our collectively better than it can if we're just someone tells you stop smoking or yeah, stop yeah, yeah. doing whatever and so it's a very programmable or it's, it's a it's a part of your brain that takes in a lot of information and arranges it so that you can understand your place in your environment and the nature of your environment and we've been amassing this information obviously since birth and so it's it's very fit and very capable of doing its job and finding elegant connections so that you can understand your environment with a greater ease and a greater i suppose sense of connectedness to your environment and so i really like trying to disable the analytical part of my brain and by doing something menial like yes. washing up or hoovering or something or heaven forbid all writers let's call you out right now how many times have you fixed a writing problem in the bathroom okay like so <laughs> uh, okay we're going to talk about this for a long time because this is i was going to ask you this anyway so i uh, about the role of, of and i'm fascinated by this the role of of, of menial tasks or rituals to the yeah. process. So, so let me just give you some background of what I hear songwriters tell me, because you said something, and I've heard this in my 10 years of doing this, you're the second person to say this, and the other person was Emily Scott Robinson, um, who just put out a new album about a, about a month ago. And she said, yeah, you said hoovering, we would say vacuuming. So, yeah. so, it, so I have heard, uh, let me see, uh, cutting vegetables, cooking, gardening, uh, yeah. vacuuming, uh, showering. And so I, I would love to explore this because I find this, I find this fascinating. Now, I, I think we can, we can, this is the under the umbrella of movement because a lot of people tell me they get song ideas when they're walking, when they're, yeah. you know, doing something. So let's first, okay. So here's the question I have. So how is it, and I, I don't know the answer to this, but how is it that, that, that hoovering it would seem to me that doing nothing 
that even vacuuming or hoovering has, you're taking a little bit of brain power to do that. So how is, how is that making you a better songwriter than doing nothing and sitting down to write a song? Because it would seem like that's where all of your brain power can be focused. Does that make sense? Yeah, but it's also about blood flow and okay. it's about um, synapse activity. And what we're trying to do in this um, process is to take the synapse activity away from the analytical brain, which is where, we, where, where we're most conscious of what we're doing. And maybe we're most clunky in our putting together. Like if we had to use our prefrontal cortex to make our heart work, we would die very quickly. <laughs> if you had to go left ventricle squeeze, right? right. Like if you had to literally give right. those commands. It's right. not something that's economic. So it's like the idea that our conscious brain is the most like capable or economic part of our brain is maybe a misnomer. Um, uh -huh. um, and so the idea is to get the blood flow going in the midbrain, which is also where our, um, which is near the colliculi, FYI, um, <laughs> and where and where all of our where our motor functions are. Yeah. So we do motor function things, and specifically things that are kind of dumb dumb that anyone could do. Nothing right. complicated, nothing that requires your analysis, but just something that you could literally tune out mentally and go into a borderline trance state doing. Yes, so and I've heard that. Vacuum cleaning. Yeah. And it's that idea of turning off the analytical brain, and then getting all the blood flow and sound activity, synapse activity happening around your midbrain. And the idea is, is that that's also where the clickly are, where they're collecting way more information and hold it, storing it in your brain, way more than your analytical brain can hold and examine. And so you'll find when you go to the bathroom that you'll get a fix for an idea immediately because you're doing something motor function that yeah. you really, really shut off when you go to the bathroom. <laughs> like you really shut off or an right. an analysis and you'll get like really quick fixes. And you'll find that if you're like doing the washing up as well, anything that you literally tune out to, you'll be like, wow, there's the idea. Yeah. And so, and that's just because there is a wealth of wisdom in the recess of your mind that is hard to con consciously access when you're kind of stumped for something but yeah. it's far easier to access if your blood flow and your synapse activity happens to be in that area so you're just bumping into the solutions um cognitively so it's about understanding the nature of your cognition and how to control where the power is it's not about working hard in this case it's about working smart and um, the idea of putting the blood flow in the right part of your brain for a solution. And so that's why sitting sometimes sitting down and doing absolutely nothing can keep you in that stumped mode until you go to the bathroom or you go and do some other thing. And so if you are sitting down and you want to do close to nothing, at least strum a guitar, because that will then activate your motor function and you'll get back into bumping into ideas again. And that is the mainstay of my entire process. I, I'll sit on the couch and I'll strum a guitar and I won't be paying attention to what I'm strumming until something coalesces in my mind. And I'll be watching, crushing Netflix, watching whatever, all the episodes of Squid Game or whatever everyone's watching now. And uh, that, would be, that would be my process, you know, the whole time. You know, in this case, it was probably all seasons of insecure, but like, like that was, right. that's, that was my process, you know, and then I would take and then I use my analytical brain to do things like the structure or, or to kind of patch ideas and go, oh, that flows, but I need to patch this to make it, you know, feel more kind of cohesive or whatever. And I'd use my analytical brain and my sense of awareness of culture and of that I grew up in and to kind of bring this to bring it home or to bring it to a state where it at least feels like most of what I'm going to bring to the song is done and if I feel like I'm missing a part then that's when I'll call someone else and then we'll talk about it and then together we'll bring bring it to fruition but it's a really big part of my process is the deactivating of my conscious mind and so if I'm being very analytical um 
I'm not writing songs. Yeah. And when I'm in a big stage of like having to engage a lot, I'm not really coming up with much intellectual property. And so I need to be in a like a like a really deactivated state at some point each year to be able to keep creating ideas. Mm -hmm. So I wrote an article in the Washington Post a couple of years ago about this idea similarly because um, I have been a runner for many years and there is a lot of research that shows and it's been done in a lab, it's scientific, it's not snake oil science. This has actually been done in the lab where they put people uh, on a treadmill for 20 minutes at about 60% max heart rate, which is really nothing more than a moderate walk. And, um, and after those 20 minutes, given them a battery of cognitive tests. And those people always score higher than people who weren't exercising because of a chemical called brain-derived neurotrophic factor that gets secreted in the brain during increased exercise, which is blood flow. So this is kind of what you're talking about. So so what's interesting is when it comes to exercising or anything like that or movement, there's a lot of scientific evidence that after that you are your most creative uh, sweet spot after about 20 minutes, it can be like I said, walking. Um, so this actually is actually research behind that. Um, it's fascinating because it's been done in the lab and they found that it doesn't take that much, but about 90 minutes post exercise, that's when people score highest on those tests. So that kind of is a little bit of what you're talking about, I think, when it comes to, mm -hmm. you know, so there's actually research. And what's interesting is that 20 minutes or sorry, 40 minutes, like isn't better, isn't twice as good as 20 minutes and 90% no. 90, 90 max heart rate isn't better than 60%. So, no. so there, and, it, and it doesn't take that much. And so they've done it with kids. They've done it. I've written about this in, in newspapers and I found it to be very fascinating. And it reminds me of what you said, because a lot of songwriters say, Oh, why is it that when I go on hikes or I go on walks or I go biking and I get these ideas and I say, that's why, you know, the other thing that, that songwriters tell me is those repetitive movements, you know, whether it's the vacuuming or the cooking or the gardening, like sometimes it's as simple as the repetition actually inspires melodies, um, yes. you know, and, and so does that happen, I guess, where in that repetitive, whatever repetitive movement that you're doing, I've heard songwriters tell me they're in their car and their turn signals they've got melodies from their turn signals um mm -hmm. or you know so how often does that happen if any where whatever it is that you're doing maybe a melody comes to you because of something actually that you're hearing yeah like a lot like especially with the tone the perceived tonality of a vacuum cleaner you can <laughs> you can potentially hear anything in that if you want to it yep. depends what you're pick it depends what you're picking up so it's the serendipity of going over something and the tonality changing as you go over whatever the heck that was on the floor and like i have had like something go i'm like okay that's when we think of something just because I i've gone over something that's kind of blocked it but it's made me think of like an octave change or something <laughs> i'm imagining like, you throwing uh, i'm imagining you throwing objects on the ground just so you can vacuum them up, right? <laughs> I, I mean, know, we, right? We could be onto something ideas. here. I know. Right? I mean, it, it, you know, <laughs> sand versus dirt versus food. We could be onto something here. I mean, this could we be. We really could. <laughs> I know. The, the, a breakthrough. I'm envisioning all the possibilities. Um, you know, just stick some auto tune on it. Bob's your <laughs> uncle, right? <laughs> exactly, right. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Um, so is it, you know, for me, at least when I write, I have a ritual. I know what works for me. I know the time of day. I know the chair. Uh, I know the pen. I know the paper. And I don't think that that is, that to me isn't, you know, superstition. It's confidence. It's knowing that it's happened before in that chair. I do like that pen. I'm much more effective in the morning than in the evening. How important is knowing a ritual um, to you as a writer and having a ritual? Because I, and let me just, you know, I, I read about the rituals of novelists, you know, all the time and poets and things like that. What is their ritual? So how important is, is having a ritual and knowing a ritual to you as, as a writer? I think um, I am a big subscriber to knowledge of power. And like, I think I learned that um, uh, the hard way when I got bilateral vocal nodules. And at the time there wasn't a great amount of research on like, voice health for singers and the application of that um and so i had to do a lot myself and then 
accidentally became a lecturer on the subject <laughs> just because I'd done so much research I had nothing else to do yeah. other than do that and uh, I, I so I took the same hand of like getting a greater understanding of my physicality and my biology to my my writing process because that's another essential part of my machine I need to be able to turn up at shows and I need to be able to be in good health and functional physically but also I need to be mentally functional to be creating these really well ideas in the first place otherwise no one's getting a gig so right. like, I really have I think it's the most important thing if you're going to be trying to make a living from it like you should at least know how you do it <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> like I I know some people are just like oh you know it just happens and it's fine. I'm like well I'm glad you you're so comforted by that. Right. I really I really wouldn't find that comfortable. I'd like to know exactly how I'm doing something so I can at least say I got into this space and this is how I did it. So it starts with the idea of knowing what time of day for me is or what state of mind for me, and it's very late. I'm a late person, huh. late night. It's got like four o'clock, five o'clock, great times for me to have stayed up until and to be like my brain to be like incapable of analyzing anything anymore. Mm-hmm. And so that's that's definitely a time of day. Um, this is morning. We're something... talking four or five in the morning, right? Yes, exactly. Okay, okay. And so okay. but I haven't woken up in the morning to do this. I've right, stayed okay. up late. And so it's the idea of coming from that end, anything that's it's proven to be very good for me um also being like doing something repetitive again like a lot of the time it's sitting on the chaise part of my sofa strumming a guitar but paying no attention to that and watching something else and then as I'm doing that like something jumping out in my mind and then singing that sometimes it's not even playing an instrument it's just like I'll often find if I've gone to see some gigs recently, I'll be thinking about the creative process more than if I'm doing gigs myself, mm-hmm. because I'm less in the kind of physicality and the practicality of like, you know, just being on the schedule and making sure that I'm working in the environment. Like I'm opening for Chris Stapleton at the moment and there's like a schedule that you have that you have to fit into and I'm not thinking about that necessarily from at someone else's show. I'm just absorbing. And so I have to be aware that I need to have time where I'm really able to stay up late without going, crap, I need to wake up early. I need to be bored out of my mind. Mm-hmm. So I need time to get bored because being bored is really central to the wandering of my mind. If I'm too engaged, or I'm too excited, or I've got stuff to do, like, my brain doesn't get there. I need to be bored. And then I need to be have done some absorbing. I need to be in the world and talking to people and having had some downtime enough to have had conversations that are not just surface level and not about work. <laughs> right. You know, um, enough to have just been to experience life. I want to talk about life. I have to experience life. <laughs> yeah. And so, like, that's been another thing that I, like, talk to my crew about. I'm like, you want these records? We're going to have to have, I'm going to have to have a life. Uh, otherwise, right. I'm not going to have anything to talk about if I'm literally just, like, hermetically sealed in a tour bus and then I go to a stage and then back to a tour bus and then back to a stage and then into the studio, back to a tour bus, back to a stage. Like, I'm, I'm not going to be able to write about anything else. And so I'm going to need life. And so... Right. Yeah, I need to be interacting with people, I need to be talking out to people about life and, you know, in the world in some way. And so that's that's like the that's the food right. that I then put into my press that I put into my process to create a tool. You know, if I'm not talking to someone about life and I'm not at, like, you know, deconstructing our our experience then songs don't happen for me. So let me ask you about the, the the literal writing of the lyrics. Are you a computer person or a pen and paper person when it comes to writing words? I'm a, I'm a phone person. You are a phone person, okay. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, the uh, notes function and voice notes are my entire life. 
so are they organized? Because I, you know, I, I've had more, uh, I've had a lot of songwriters tell me that they have, it's funny, I don't think, I don't think people realize this, but I interviewed uh, uh, Lori Mayberry from Churches a few months ago, and she told me how she, um, she has all the lyrical ideas organized on an Excel spreadsheet. And she was like, if people only knew that, you know, an artist has their lyrical ideas on an Excel spreadsheet. And I've heard that a lot. So how organized, like, you're, I'm, I'm imagining your notes app is just filled with ideas, but is there any organization where you can go back through those, you know, instead of saying, oh man, where's that thing I put in here a couple months ago? Is there any, I mean, is there like, they have like a file system, I guess. Yeah, like, um, first and foremost, I have a way that I label my ideas um, and so that I know like how to find them so i have a system of identifying these ideas and then i yeah. have a system and then what i will do periodically maybe every like six months or so i'll go back over my ideas and then like i'll arrange the voice notes into a dropbox and that like i'll try and do that straight after i deliver a record so I'll deliver a record and then I'll look at what's what I've got that I didn't deliver in that record or I didn't record in that process because we obviously um, release record more than we release. Um, and I'll start um, amassing those ideas for what would seemingly follow whilst I'm in the headspace of record making and in the headspace of track listing and of mixing and mastering and all of that all those areas that I get into on a technical side but I'm still in the process of thinking about the record I make sure I start amassing the next record right at the delivery point of the previous and so that then gives me something that I can keep going back and visiting and adding things to and go does this feel representative of where I am and how I'm feeling? And like those titles will then um, sync up with titles in my notes function so I can just search for those titles. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I file it via my voice notes. Okay, and, gotcha. And that's what it is. But I always name them with the idea and like the the type, the thing that I realized either inspired it or the kind of place or the time that place I was so that I have like a bit of a, like a, an aesthetic hint uh, or a location hint or something. Yeah. And so um, yeah, it's like that, but it's always about that Dropbox. And once I know <laughs> that there are good, enough good ideas in that Dropbox, then I know that I've got like potentially ideas I can take into a co-writing space and go okay I've, this one's pretty much finished it just needs a few tweaks this one's like half an idea let do you want to get in on it kind of thing and I just make sure I always have like a decent vat of ideas and I do that at the end of a record so that I'm not ever writing under duress and that's one yeah. thing I'm 100% trying to avoid all the time is that idea of like having to write a record and not having enough and then having to just go in and write a bunch of stuff on the day, which is also possible. And you can come up with great ideas, but I don't want to ever have to do that. Yeah. <laughs> I just yeah. want that to be like a luxury that I can do sometimes. Yeah. Um, you mentioned to someone earlier, maybe think about um, Ernest Hemingway said that all writers should go to art galleries to get inspired. And I'm curious, how often do you get inspired by other artistic mediums whether it's you know, visual art or words or things like that when it comes to your songs oh big time <laughs> that's another big part of it there's a digital artist called adam martinakis um and there's a piece that he did um um i remember just like happening upon it whilst buying some art from this place called the gauntlet gallery and like a few, few and I saw this bit and I was like I think they were out at the time which was kind of annoying and but it had it just really evoked a feeling in me and it's actually then inspired one of my photo shoots um 
um, the poster that's inside my vinyl is uh, okay. partly inspired um, inspired by this digital artist. And uh, yeah, so like that was something that um, like inspired maybe like the aesthetic on some of the songs, certainly for Stand For Myself and it's slightly psychedelic kind of energy. It came from that that piece. Um, and I suppose watching Insecure, like that inspired me to write something from the point of view or to make sure that my framing was um, really thinking about um, dark skinned women of color um, at all. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that I wasn't desperately trying to be general. I think like maybe on the first record I was being general out of necessity because like I we didn't have necessarily a lot of crossover with the people I was writing with with regards to like where we were born like or the generation that we were born into or the background that we were born into or the right. you know our gender or anything for that matter and I realized that actually it was going to be quite exciting to be particularly personal and that there's strength in being able to be that true about your experience and mm-hmm. so that became a really kind of big necessity um was to kind of farm the truth wherever I could farm it from and yeah and yeah, the I'm... Truman Show I keep forgetting <laughs> like really? the Truman Show was massive yeah so um on the back of the vinyl and you know there's um like it plays into so the videos some of the videos were inspired by the visual art as well and like play into the so the artwork the videos and the lyrics kind of all um I almost forgot to like that was another big part of it so this Adam Martinakis was kind of stand for myself inspired aesthetically and then the poster that's in the in the middle of the vinyl but on the back you've got me on a motorcycle in this kind of blue cloud set with some steps that go up to a door that goes to heaven knows where. Um, And that was inspired by the Truman Show. And that when, you know, when he rose up to the edge and he bumps into the sky and then he realizes that he can just get out of the boat and it's like, you know, knee deep and he can just walk up the stairs and, you know, escape. For all intents and purposes. And so like the diamond studded shoes video is set in that Truman Show world and when you pan out it looks kind of false like everything doesn't quite make sense in that space and then like the idea is that the artwork is where I'm escaping and there's the doors in the background and then when I emerge from that door is on the front of the cover that's the kind of tunnel that I've walked through and then that's where starlight happens. And so everything was like inspired by um, like this idea of um, disorientation. And so the yeah, Adam Martinakis piece is very, you can't really see the depth of field because of the almost magic eye nature of the work. And then, and then, yeah. And then that idea of purposeful misdirection in creating a completely false construct and then willfully escaping it to go to, well, in Truman's case, it was just an actual real profound relationship as opposed to the one that was like pre-prescribed for him. And yeah. that's really that's really what the album's about. And so I really wanted, so it felt like that was a really wonderful marriage of concepts that that movie could then feed into the depth of the narrative. And every time we kind of, pertain to doing a visual we've got like a purpose behind it it's not just that it's something that looks pretty is that it's going to be speaking on like like deeper connections to things like that's always the theme and so yeah Yeah. a big part of it was also Truman Show as well that is amazing um well listen (laughs) I know you're busy and I'll, I'll let you go but thank you very much Oh, my pleasure. Thank you so much.